Okay, so we're going to move on to chapter five today. I wanted to say a couple of words about the exam. Um, so for written questions, and this is general advice uh, I would give you. So if you get an essay question and somebody says something like, compare, you know, explain the difference between Medicare and Medicaid, right? Um, the first thing you want to do is say, is, is define your terms. So a good way to like be successful on an, on a exam of that, uh, on an exam question like that, it's a, this is not a clever essay, right? You're not trying to show you're clever or, or, or funny, right? So you're going to define terms. You're going to say, okay, Medicare is right, a a program run by the federal government, financed with federal tax dollars, uh, and it is meant for uh, people over the age of 65, people who are fully disabled, and then there are a couple of other cats and dogs, um, one of which is end stage renal disease. Medicaid is a um, joint federal state program that is managed by, jointly by the federal government and the states financed jointly by the federal government and the states and is for and is a poverty program. Um, and then you could say, okay, so the main differences would be, you know, who governs it uh, and who it's for, something like that. Um, the disease, illness and disease, that's probably, that, that actually would have been the full answer, right? So, so that, that question really was basically two sentences and you're done. The illness and disease and deafness, Right, more to that point would be, okay, Ill, according to the anthropological model, illness is a, um, a factor that is determined by um, uh, the individual um, and is a subjective evaluation of their ability to perform their roles and functions in society. Disease is a state that is uh, determined by a social authority, usually a physician, um, where the individual is judged uh, on a subject, uh, judged subjectively not to be able to perform their roles and functions in society. And then you can say deafness now fits into that as, you know, and so on. So my recommendation to you when you've got a problem like that or a question like that, it's not just for my class. What I'm looking for are certain elements, right? I'm looking for you to, okay, for that particular question, do you, have you demonstrated to me that you understand what illness was? Do you, have you demonstrated to me you understand what disease was? And then have you given me an explanation of the actual question, which was where does, you know, how can you be, how can a person regard themselves, uh, be, be, uh, uh, how can deafness be a disease, but not an illness? Right. So then you explain that. So like if you could hit those three things, it's probably like, you know, that 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 answer would have been like three sentences. Um, most of you did well on both of those questions. I'm just I'm just kind of saying, but some of you gave me a whole long kind of song and dance rather than just getting right to the point. So um, uh, so so when you see a, pro, a a question like that, try to pick out what are the key, you know, what are the key things that 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 the examiner is asking me and demonstrate you know those things because i'm really I'm, I'm trying to grade as fast as i can and if you can give it to me fast makes me happy and i move on i give you full credit right if i have to read it carefully and try to impute what it is you're trying to tell me you know about your uncle who was deaf and you know and how you felt about seeing that on tv or whatever you know i i don't need all that stuff right i just just you know if you can hit try to understand from the question what you're really being asked and you'll, you'll just do better, right? Uh, and you'll probably be able to answer it faster. All right. Um, okay, so we're gonna jump into chapter five, medical technology. I sent you the slides, uh, they're on Canvas. Everybody able to get them if you wanted them? Yes, no, okay. Yes, they're available, okay. Last time I thought they were available and they weren't. And so there's also a, a, a two page Microsoft uh, uh, Word document that summarizes some economic concepts. We're going to use them in this chapter and the next chapter. I won't cover them all today. So let's talk about medical technology because this is what really differentiates um, the United States from everybody else is our incredible uh, use of medical technology. So what is medical technology? Your book defines it as the practical application of the, of the scientific body of knowledge for the purpose of improving health and creating efficiencies in healthcare. Um, 
you know, what does that mean? It means that providers uh, are using it to provide higher quality, lower cost, and or a greater quantity of care, right? So it is usually an extension of the provider and the provider's ability to provide care. Now there's two economic concepts that I want you to think about here, complements and substitutes. And we'll keep kind of coming back to this idea in when we talk about medical technology. So complementary technology is used to improve the delivery um, of the same kind of care. Right. So what's an example of complementary technology? Well, you want something that goes together. So a radiologist and an MRI machine are complementary technologies. Right. You're going to use them both together. You're not going to use one or the other. And an MRI machine is not a substitute for a radiologist. The MRI machine is useless by itself. A radiologist, don't tell them I said this, is also useful, useless by him or herself, right? The radiologist needs the, uh, the technology. The two work together, so they complement each other, right? When you see complement, think like uh, Reese's peanut butter cup, right? The two great tastes that go great together slogan, right? So it's the peanut butter and the chocolate. They go, you know, combined together, they make something that's even better than the parts alone, and a perfect complement means you can't you, there the uh, uh, you can eat peanut butter you can eat chocolate so they're you know separately um, uh, and so they're not what we would call perfect complements in the sense that uh, they're useless apart whereas a radiologist and an MRI machine are basically useless apart right um, so think about it complement is like is like a peanut butter cup right you want to have the two together and that gives you the maximum value. A substitute technology allows for the replacement of one technology, excuse me, uh, well, of one technology or, or, or human labor with, um, uh, uh, with a new model or new means of providing care. And I'm going to show you some examples of that. But a, um, an example of this now is, you know, going back to radiology, we're starting to see um, computer, uh, I would say within your lifetime, radio, there will be many fewer radiologists because the remaining radiologists will be using AI to read the scans, to read the images that they get because it's already been shown that AI does a better job of recognizing disease than human radiologists do because AIs don't get tired, right? They don't make mistakes. Their mind doesn't wander. They're not thinking about going golfing or, you know, what they're going to have for dinner. Um, so once an AI is trained, um, it can do, it can actually do a better job, but AIs are not perfect. And so what you, what you'll see going forward in my mind is, um, uh, is, fewer radiologists and basically what the radiologist will be doing is over reading meaning an ai will do the first shot and then a radiologist will will kind of do quality control and look at after the fact okay and then an ai may say hey this particular image doesn't match up with any of my any of the patterns i've seen in the past i need you to look at it and give me and tell me what i'm you know what i'm missing here doctor and the doctor will go in, and this is actually what referred to this as, is, is training the AI, like good AI. Right? Um, so, so it is teaching the AI what it's seeing. And once you teach it the one time, well, that's a, that's a whatever tumor. And the AI is like, okay, I've, I've, I've rem I now remember what that tumor looks like. And the next time it shows up, I just automatically, yep, that's a whatever tumor, right? And I'm over, grossly oversimplifying, but it's clear at some point we will see um, much like we in, in our life, in your lifetime, probably in mine, we will see, you know, driverless cars become the norm because once you have a, right now, driverless cars are kind of dangerous because we have a bunch of humans doing random crazy stuff and, and driverless cars have a hard time figuring out why a human is 
doing something like all you Massachusetts drivers that just make me crazy, right? Um, uh, uh, actually, the main drivers are much worse than the Massachusetts drivers. And, you know, we've, we've decided, we used to think it was the Massachusetts drivers. We've now concluded that main drivers are actually more of a menace. But the problem is you have main drivers out there doing crazy stuff that's unpredictable and, and AI driven cars can't deal with unpredictable. So, however, if you fill the, if you get all the humans off the road and all the cars are AI driven, they, not, they, they all will move in predictable manner. And not only that, they can talk to each other, right? And, um, and we will probably see traffic accidents go to you know, near zero. Um, so same kind of idea with things like imaging. So right now, so I told you, I think I told you, my dad made the choice between being a pathologist and being a... Um, and being a, a radiologist, and he regrets, and I didn't really regret, he, he, he loved pathology, but, you know, financially, the radiology tools, the complements that went with radiologists over his career kept getting better and better. MRI didn't exist when he, or it was just at its infancy, you know, so the value of a radiologist keeps going, has been, has kept going up because the complementary tools that they're able to use keep getting better. And so the value of a radiologist keeps going up, whereas pathology, the tools are roughly the same. They haven't changed all that much. And then on top of that, we changed the business models. So there's a bunch of things going on. So actually the income of pathologists was falling while the income of radiologists was going up. Um, mostly because we were finding substitutes for pathologists, but the complementary tools for radiologists keep getting, kept getting better and they are continuing to get better. The problem for radiologists now is that there's a substitute rolling in behind them. It's gonna wipe out the field pretty much, right? The AIs. So you're not gonna need, you know, if you've got an AI that can read, you know, thousands of, of scans a day, you're gonna need maybe one radiologist sitting someplace that gets all the kind of weird, Here, here's a weird one doc, review this one, here's a weird, you know, so you're gonna, rather than having the doctor read a thousand scans a day, right, the doctors, the doc, the, the machine will read a thousand scans a day and, and of those thousand scans, the doctor will have to do a handful of quality control, you know, decisions. And so what you can do then is you can take one radiologist sitting say at Dartmouth-Hitchcock who now, manages all of the radiology for the state of New Hampshire. Think about that, right? Whereas right now we probably have five radiologists that went with Douglas alone. When, when there's, you know, when there's an a, a capability of having an AI read basically all of the scans, all of the images that are done in the state of New Hampshire. And the only time you're gonna need a live person to look at them is when there's an, a potential error, you can eliminate most of the doctors. It's kind of like farming, right? Back in the day, 90 something percent of us, 95% of us, and this was not that long ago, like in the 1800s, 95% of the American population lived on farms, right? We started collapsing that as we got better technology, as we got better plows, as we got, um, you know, we moved away from horse-drawn um, uh, plows to, to, you know, mechanized to, to gasoline powered tractors. Now we have tractors that run on, that are Bluetooth controlled, right? Uh, uh, and, and run on AI so that the farmer basically has a laptop, goes out to the shed, turns on his laptop, click, click, click. And all of a sudden the, you know, the, the, the combine, you know, turns on and starts driving into the field, right? And then if you haven't seen modern farm equipment, oh my God, it's amazing. Like, it, you know, the combine is like 15, 20, 15 feet tall, it's enormous. And that combine can now do the work of probably what, a, you know, in one day, what the work of would have been done back in, you know, the 1800s by 100 farmers, right? And so that's why so many people have left farms and come to, come to, the, um, to the city to do much more interesting work for the most part for all of us, right? And why are, we're so rich is not that long ago, we spent most of our days, most of our effort just getting food. Right. Today, you know, the food budget of the average American is something like 5% of the house, 10, maybe 5 to 10% of the household budget, depending on how wealthy you are. Right. Um, whereas before, not that long ago, like 
in the 20th century, in the early first half of the 20th century, your food budget would have been closer to half. Today, your parents probably spend somewhere in 5%, 10% at most on food. And the fact that they spend that much is mostly because they, they, they go, you, you know, I'm looking around, Dunkin' Donuts and are a lot more expensive than preparing it. You guys don't have, I see one. Okay, so, um, you know, you eating out, I'm just, I'm singling you out, yes. But yeah, uh, I'm surprised there's, my last class I, I taught right before, I had at least five kids with Dunkin' Donuts and I guess it's because it's the eight o'clock class. Um, but, so you've already had your Dunkin' Donuts. Is that, what I'm, is that what I'm kind of getting? No, you didn't have yours? You don't like Dunkin' Donuts? Are you a Starbucks person? Trader Joe's or what is it, uh, Aroma Joe's? Starbucks. You like Starbucks? All right, okay. So anyway, the fact is, right, you can make, you know, 10, uh, uh, you know, 10 cups of coffee, maybe, you know, maybe 20 cups of coffee um, for the price of one cup of coffee from Starbucks, right? Um, and so the reason that we spend as much as we do is because half of what we, you know, half of our food budget is spent on going out to eat. If you only ate at home, right, or you only ate home cooked meals, you could cut your food budget, you know, probably to just a couple of percent of your, of your household budget. So the point here is, you know, farming, you've seen this incredible substitution of technology for labor. And that's the takeaway here is, is, is substitution is largely what we see is a substitution of technology for labor. So we're going to see in your lifetime, um, radiologists losing their jobs in droves, right? So, um, uh, but there are also compliments and we'll talk. So we're gonna talk about examples of both of these as we go, but I want you to kind of have that idea of a compliment. That's a technology that allows me to do my job even better, right? A substitute is a technology that allows me to eliminate labor in particular. That's where it's really interesting because healthcare is a labor intensive uh, field. It allows me to substitute away, get rid of labor or, or you know, come up with a new mode of delivery. And these two things can work either to increase prices or decrease prices. So as we are able to, to substitute um, technology for human labor in farming, the prices of food have collapsed. They've gone to, to you know, a tiny fraction of what they once were. Um, and so that has made all of us much, much, much more. It, first of all, it wiped out all the farmers, which is really sad. You know, so if you had to read like Grapes of Wrath or something like that in, in high school, um, you know, very sad, you know, farms all, you know, farmers all lost their money. However, we are all, all so, so much better off that that all happened. Right? Um, we'll all be very sad for the radiologists when they lose their jobs, but we will all be better off as a result of that happening because people who would have become radiologists will become orthopedic surgeons, for example. And then we'll have, and that's a one that's hard to substitute. All right. So keep those ideas in your head as we go. <clears throat> We're gonna talk, um, so this is our kind of our agenda for, for this, these two classes. I'm gonna spend a bunch of time talking about regulation and economics. Um, it's really important stuff. It is general. We're gonna apply it to healthcare in particular but it applies across the board to any industry. So I'm gonna teach you some general economics um, today uh, and, and we will apply it to healthcare, but it, this information is, is, is relevant regardless of whether you're interested in healthcare or any other field. Then we'll talk about kind of medical devices, pharmaceuticals and IT, all super important stuff. So we'll apply some of the stuff we've been talking about. So I wanna talk about a bunch of things. This is the list of stuff we're gonna talk about. I'm gonna jump here to this next slide. So this is Federalist number 51. So this, is, you may have heard of the Federalist papers written by Madison and Hamilton um, and Jay, I believe, when we were trying to create, a, uh, create the constitution of the United States. So this is post revolutionary war. We were trying to form uh, the United States and come up with a constitution which was ratified in 1788. And so Madison, Hamilton, and I believe it again, Jay, correct me if you, any history guys here, correct me if I'm wrong on that, wrote this series of essays called the Federalist Papers. This is one of my favorite ones. Um, and it says, if men were angels, no, no government would be necessary. If angels were to govern men, 
neither external nor internal controls on government would be necessary. In framing a government which is to be administered by men over men, the great difficulty lies in this. You must first enable the government to control the governed and in the next place, uh, in the next place oblige it to, to control itself. A dependence on the people is no doubt the primary control on the government, but experience has taught mankind the necessity of auxiliary precautions. So the, the, I wanna break that down for a minute, right? So if men were angels, no government would be necessary. All right, what does that mean? People aren't perfect, right? People are selfish, right? People will do naughty things to each other, right? We left to our own devices. We lie, cheat, and steal quite often, right? Um, we tend to view other people who are a little bit different from us as unworthy of their things or their freedom, right? We have a long history of that in the United States. So if men were angels, no government would be necessary, right? If we were all perfect, and we were all angels, meaning we would only do good things when, you know, when the lights are out, we'd all, do, we'd all be nice. When no one was looking, we wouldn't steal stuff, right? Then we wouldn't need government. So, and if angels were to govern men, neither in external nor internal, uh, if angels were to govern men, neither external nor internal controls on the government would be necessary. So if people became angels when they got elected to political office, right? then we wouldn't need to have any controls on them because they would be angels and they would always do the right thing. And we all know that politicians all do the right thing all the time, right? Right, no, they don't, right? So, um, you know, there was, I forget who said it, but what is it? Um, uh, power corrupts and, and total power corrupts totally, something like that, right? That's some British, British um, person. So. Once people have power, they tend to try to keep power, right? They tend to try to feather their own nests, right? We have a long history in the United States of political corruption. Um, so if, we, if, if, if politicians were, were actually perfect, if they were actually angels, we wouldn't have to worry about it. Instead, because people who, the people who occupy the seats of power are themselves imperfect and really come to like power, uh, we have to create checks on them, right? So that's the argument here. And so once we have, once we are putting imperfect people in charge of imperfect people, right? We have kind of a, a, a series of problems that need to be solved. And so what they're saying is we're gonna frame a government, basically it says, we've got to give those people in power enough power to actually make the other people do the right thing. But once you do that, what's the check on these people? Right, and how do you avoid tyranny? Because that was the big question that you know um, the founders were trying to wrestle with: was how do we build a government that's going to not turn into some sort of autocracy, right? Um, and so we're not going to get into you know checks and balances and all that stuff, uh, which is really interesting stuff. But he, he goes on to say, look, having elections is probably not enough, right? Just having elections is probably not enough, so we need some checks and balances. So the main, the main takeaway here is that the first two lines, right, in my mind is, hey, let's remember that people are imperfect, and when we give them power, they tend to misbehave. So we really need to keep an eye on them, right? Um, so hold that in mind, so, because what I want to talk about now is a couple of theories. Um, so your book talks about this idea of market failure. What is market failure? It's when markets fail to produce a socially efficient quantity of goods at, a so, at socially efficient prices. All right, what does that mean? That means that some people, in healthcare terms, that means some people aren't insured. Some people don't have access to healthcare. Some people don't have adequate access to have access, but don't have adequate access to healthcare, right? That's a market failure. What is the socially efficient, it's hard to define exactly what socially efficient is, right? But what we look around, what those of us who care about other people, which is most of us, um, look around and say, there are people who are suffering. This is a problem. Why isn't, if the market is so great, um, uh, why is it that there are people who are hungry, who can't get healthcare, right? Who don't have shelter, um, who you know don't go to good schools, 
There's a whole laundry list of what we would call market failures in the United States, or you could call market failures in the United States. Now, yes, this is true. However, there's also another angle, which is when you take imperfect people and you give them power over imperfect people, you also can generate government failure, right? So this is something your book doesn't talk about that I wanna add to kind of your thinking about policies, whether that's healthcare policy, whether that is education policy, transportation policy, or whatever industry you care about policy, right? And that is, there are going to be market failures in the sense that the market is not going to generate, is not at any given time going to generate a perfect solution such that everybody gets everything they ever wanted or needs. So we can say, okay, let's step in and have the government step in and fix the problem. Let's just pass a law, make it so that everybody gets healthcare. Okay. Um, so, so that often doesn't work. Um, and it results, in, so there are two kinds of government failure that we can talk about. One is passive government failure. And this is the idea that, hey, there's a market failure. The government could fix it and it doesn't. So that's passive mark. That's, that's a sin of omission, if you will, right? In the sense of it's government not taking action. So that's passive government failure. Active government failure is when government takes action and it actually makes stuff worse. And we're gonna come to that a little later when we talk about certificate of need laws, which we put into place with good intentions. Um, and realized that they actually were being abused, used and abused by selfish, uh, self-interested actors in the marketplace. So got a couple of ideas here. So as we go along, as you think about laws and passing laws in, in healthcare or in the industry of your choice, think about on the one hand, how is the market not delivering all the goods that you and services that you would like to see happen? And on the other hand, what is the government trying to do to fix it? And is it, is it not taking action where it could potentially fix a market failure? Or is it taking action nominally uh, to fix a market failure, but it's actually making the situation worse? Um, so we'll hold those ideas in mind too, because what I wanna do now um, is talk about two theories of regulation. So policy, right? Much of policy is actually made by what is broadly called the administrative state. So the executive branch, so the government has three branches, right? We know this. They are what? What are the three branches of the federal government? Executive, judicial, and legislative. Good. So we have the president who oversees the executive branch of government. We have the legislative, which is the Congress, and then, we have the uh, and then we have the judicial. And those three were designed to balance each other out, right? So without getting, you know, that's a whole, you read the Federalist Papers, we won't get into all that. That's, but that there's a, the design was very much deliberate to put them all in tension with each other, that they're gonna check each other um, with the assumption that they're, this is the beauty of the American constitution. The assumption is, that none of the people occupying any of those positions is an angel. And so when, when one of them gets up to no good, they're gonna start impinging on the interests of the other two. And so the other two are gonna hold them in check, right? Um, and, and, and likewise, so regardless of which, which um, uh, uh, branch it is. So, so the executive branch has grown bigger and bigger. As government has gotten bigger, the executive branch has grown bigger and bigger. Congress passes laws that are, when, a, when Congress writes a law, it's pretty general in nature. And if you read you know, some, of the, you know, some of the ACA, it says broad things like, um, the Secretary of Health and Human Services shall uh, construct uh, uh, markets for health insurance um, in, you know, uh, and make them available to states that don't structure their own. It doesn't give them any a whole lot of detail about how to go about doing it, um, how the market should function and so forth. So it gives, 
and this and it wouldn't really it's a real challenge for congress to write all the details into law and it also once the details are written into law it hamstrings right it limits it kind of puts shackles on um the uh, uh, executive branch that's now trying to execute the laws that have been it have been written. So the more specific the law is, the more challenging it is for the particular um, agency to execute the law. So the laws are by um, are written intentionally in somewhat of a vague fashion to give. Um, the agencies that are going to execute the laws some flexibility in order to actually um, uh, 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 to, to generate the best possible outcome. So laws that are written too specific wind up getting having all kinds of problems. And then once it's written into law, the only way to fix it is for the legislature to come back and change the law. So, so laws today are written fairly vaguely with a lot of you know, broad language, which then is interpreted by the agencies and the agencies, whether that's health and human services, which is the focus of this class, transportation, de defense, you know, state, whatever, right? The agencies have a lot of authority. And so that's your regulatory structure. It starts with the legis legislature, they write the broad framework, but then much of the what is actually law in the sense of the, the laws we actually have to obey are created by the agencies, you know, um, as they implement the broad guidance given to them by legislature. So regulatory structure starts with legislation and then works its way down. The courts sometimes get involved and modify laws as written or strike them down if they're regarded as violating the constitution. Um, so you have kind of two broad theories of government and government regulation. The first is public interest uh, theory. And public interest theory basically says the people who run the government are angels and they always do good things, right? Um, that's kind of being a little bit facetious, but, but basically it is, it is unfortunately somewhat of an idealized uh, 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 agent, right? that is involved like so we we have some problem we're like let's you know let's get nancy pelosi to write a law you know get it passed through congress get the president to sign it and everything will be better the problem there is you know um we have uh uh politicians uh who are always up for office or, or in particular the house is every two years so they're constantly being re-elected every two years they're constantly having to raise money uh in order to um you know in order to run for office um and so they have they don't always um have the public interest in mind a lot of times what they also have in mind is their own political survival so there are a lot of Republicans, and and I and I'm going to say something kind of political, but I'm going to uh, uh, but I'm trying to say it more as a fact. There are a lot of Republican politicians who don't support Trump, but they won't say that publicly. Now, whether you support Trump or not, you, that's something you should just acknowledge. This is a fact. There are a lot of Republicans who don't support Trump and his his actions, um, but they won't say so publicly because they're afraid of their that they will lose their seat. That is a lack of moral courage. Shame on all of them, right? Whether they're right or wrong, if they don't support Trump, they should say that they don't support Trump. And then they should take their beating if, they're, if their state constituency supports Trump, right? So I, well, I'm not saying whether you should support Trump or not. I'm not saying whether they should or not. I'm saying they should say the truth, right? That's, that's a thing that we want them to do. And they're not doing it, right? So that is an example of, of real government agent, right? Real people in real government doing dishonest, in my mind, dishonest things, right? They are not doing what they have sworn to do um, when they were elected. So the reality is um, uh, that, that real government people in, in government don't 
always act in the public interest. <clears throat> um, there are, there are, you know, um, there are kind of soft examples of this, and there are hard examples of like there's real bribery, real theft, right? Real uh, nepotism, and then there is kind of this soft kind of stuff like kind of what I was just describing, where they're not, you know, not speaking truth, right? They're not stealing anything necessarily, um, but they aren't they aren't serving the public in, to the to the best of their uh, to to the degree that they should be. Um, so public interest regulation and theories of people who embrace public interest uh, regulation tend to really focus on market failure. Um, and they're subject to what, what uh, uh, economists call the nirvana fallacy. And the nirvana fallacy, you may hear this phrase, what the nirvana fallacy does is it compares, so nirvana is this like heaven place where everything is perfect, right? Um, so what they do is they compare very often people who are acting in the public interest, who are trying to make an argument for government intervention, compare imperfect market outcomes. People, some people don't get healthcare. Some people aren't getting enough food. You know, some people aren't get, are getting crappy education um, from public schools, so forth, right? They compare the kind of these market failures to a, a perfect possible outcome where if the government acted exactly the way we expected and everybody responded to the law the way we want them to respond, everything would be perfect. And so we're comparing reality to a fantasy. That's, that's the nirvana fallacy. You don't want to what you don't want to do is compare an imperfect market outcome to an imaginary perfect outcome that would happen if in your imaginary world, the government did everything it said it was going to do and everybody reacted the way you want them to react. That's not reality, right? When you think about, I want the government to fix X, Y, Z, you need to think about your actual interactions with government agencies and what's that, what that is like, right? So when you think, I want the government to fix healthcare, you should think, what was it like last time I tried to get my license renewed or get my title at, at the DMV, right? And just from, oh. And just remember that, you know, the DMV is full of very nice people, right? There, I'm not saying there's anything, you know, there's nice people, there's probably some mean people there too. Um, but for the most part, the DMV is full of people who come to, to work every day trying to do a, a good job. So I'm not saying that they're bad people. It's just that it's an imperfect system, right? And so you don't wanna compare a market failure to an imaginary perfect outcome. So public choice, which is actually kind of the field of economics, a, a, one of the field of economics that I studied uh, and that I, that, that I continue to, to, to study is called public choice. And public choice, choice imagines um, and models situations where, uh, where they look at both the government and the private sector and they say, everybody in all of these organizations is a human being and they all have personal interests at stake, right? Congressmen want to be reelected. Um, uh, uh, people that work in the DMV want to go home at five o'clock and they don't want to stay late, right? So on. And oh, by the way, people that work in business are greedy and selfish, right? And care about profit. And I wrote something, I remember I was working on it uh, when I was a, a grad student in, in doing my PhD and I was working on something. Um, and I basically, my, my conclusion was, well, you know, business people are greedy, something like that. And my professor looks at me and says, congratulations, you just discovered that water flows downhill. Um, you know, uh, I'm like, he's like, that's, that's kind of baked into our assumptions, right? So when you model, when you model behavior in the marketplace and, and including government action, you want to assume under public choice theory, you assume that everybody is out to try to kind of do the best they can for themselves. Not that they're going to necessarily cheat and lie, but that they're going to do what's good for them first. Right? Um, and so public choice theory considers both market failure and government failure and tries to kind of find a balance between the two. Um, 
So there's this wonderful theory that I'd like you to remember um, called bootleggers and Baptists. Um, and, it's, uh, and it's, a little bit, it's a little bit of fun. Um, and the idea is, uh, I didn't write down the guy's name. He's a, uh, I have a wonderful podcast with him explaining his theory. He'll pop to me in a second. Uh, he's from Clemson University, so he's in South Carolina. He's got a wonderful Southern accent when he tells his story. It's just wonderful to listen to, and, and hence the bootleggers and Baptists, because he's from the Southeast. And so he tells a story, he says, <clears throat> to kind of illustrate, because he's a public choice guy. So he tries to illustrate this story, and I think it's useful. He says, every time you think about a policy that's being proposed, think about this. Imagine um, you're in a town, um, and the town is debating whether it's going to be wet or dry. What does that mean? We don't have these up here, but we do in the South. What's a wet town or a wet county versus a dry county? What does that mean? In a, in, a, in a dry county, you cannot buy alcohol. So when I was stationed in Louisiana, the next, uh, uh, we were in, we in, uh, forget, they call them parishes in Louisiana. So I think it was Beauregard Parish was the next, was the next county over. It was just a couple of miles away. And the town was DeRitter. DeRitter was quite a bit bigger than Leesville where I actually lived. Um, uh, and so, but you couldn't, but, but DeRitter, I think it was Beauregard Parish was a dry parish or dry county. So, you, so if you went out to dinner at a nice Italian restaurant in, in DeRitter, which there was one, it was Mom, Mama's Italian restaurant. It was the nicest Italian restaurant uh, in the area which isn't saying a whole lot because um, it was in rural Louisiana, but it was actually pretty good. Um, uh, you could go to this nice Italian restaurant, but you couldn't, they couldn't serve you alcohol. You could bring your own. They, they, they'd allow you to bring your own, um, but you couldn't, you couldn't buy alcohol. You couldn't even, you couldn't buy alcohol in stores. You couldn't buy alcohol. You know, there were no bars. And what's crazy about that is because in Leesville, there's a, there was a drive through, um, uh, uh, smoothie uh, stand, like alcohol smoothie, right? So you could go, um, you could literally drive through, go to the window, and they would hand you in your car with the car running, right? A, 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 a plastic, you know, sippy cup uh, full of, of uh, uh, mixed drinks, right? So my favorite one was Slap Your Mama, uh, but there was also Monkey Shine and some other ones. They were great. And the way that they would, can I borrow your cup for just a second? I promise I won't drink out of it. So they'd give you a cup that looked like this with a straw in it. And there'd be a little bit of the paper on the straw at the top. That was considered a closed container in Louisiana. Um, and I actually lived on post. Okay, so, I, so in order to get back to my house, I would have to drive through a, uh, the guard shack uh, on post. So there were MPs standing there at the post and I'd have my, my slap your mama in the, in the, um, uh, uh, in the uh, cup holder next to me as I drove through the, the checkpoint and the guards would you know, salute me and I'd go on my way, right, with my cup. So that's, a, that's Louisiana, right? So in this town, you could buy alcohol in a drive-through stand. In the next town, you couldn't buy alcohol at all, right? So dry county. Um, so, uh, so, so since we don't have that up here, it's kind of entertaining. And the South is just full of incredibly religious people, most of whom are wonderful, um, some, who are, some of whom are profoundly hypocritical. Uh, but, um, you know, but, but religion is a big, much, much more public, much more present than it is up here in the Northeast. Um, and so, you, so imagine you have, um, you're in Deritter, right? Uh, or in Deritter, or, or you're in Leesville, let's say. Let me change that. You're in Leesville. It's a wet county uh, or wet parish. And the Baptists in town, Baptists, good Baptists don't drink alcohol. They don't drink alcohol. They don't drink coffee. They don't drink any stimulants. So if you're a good Baptist, you don't do any of that. Um, so the, the, the Baptists uh, decide that they, you know, things are going so well in Deritter uh, with keeping people from, from drinking their preferred mixed frozen mixed drinks um, that they want to try to pass the same law in Leesville and make it illegal to sell alcohol in Leesville. Um, 
and let's say they only want to, they, just to get started, they only want to pass it on Sundays. So, you, so we're going to shut down the bars on Sunday because Sunday is God's day, right? And so the Baptists genuinely, let's, let's for the moment assume that the Baptists genuinely believe this. They genuinely believe that alcohol is bad for you. It's not just bad for you physically, it's bad for your soul. They care about your soul, right? And what they want to do is prevent you from drinking alcohol on Sundays, at least. We'll get started with that, and then maybe we can move on to full dry counting. And so they proposed this ordinance that would switch Leesville or in, and the, par the parish from a wet county to a dry county. Now they do that and they genuinely believe that they're doing it in your interest. They are worried about your eternal soul. I'm gonna get you to church, right? Um, and, and so they're genuinely worried about you. They're gonna you know, keep you from drinking at least, preferably when you're not, now that you're not drunk, you're gonna to come to church and you, know, you will be a better person for it. So they genuinely believe this. So they're out there supporting. So they go to the town. So, so um, I'll think of his name in a second. He says, you can imagine they're going to be out there on the uh, city hall steps, you know, uh, cheering on um, the, uh, this, this law that's going to make buying alcohol on Sundays illegal. There's going to be a second group of people who maybe aren't on the steps, but are maybe buying the signs for the Baptist to, you know, go stand on the steps. Right. Maybe they're passing some money to the city councilman to support um, this law getting passed. Those people are who? I'll give you a hint. The bootleggers. Now, who, what's a bootlegger? They illegally sell alcohol, right? Bootleggers illegally sell alcohol, right? So, Back during Prohibition, we had lots of bootleggers. They'd go up to Canada, they'd buy whiskey and, and beer, and then they'd truck it back down uh, to down here. Or, or we'd have backyard stills and they'd be making, you know, they'd be making moonshine, right? So bootleggers are people who illegally sell alcohol. So why would the bootleggers support this law? Sorry? They'll be able to sell more alcohol because it's illegal? Exactly, right? Right now, who's gonna buy my backyard moonshine? So you can either buy Bonica's backyard moonshine or you can go to Hannaford and buy a bottle of wine or a, or a six pack of beer, right? So when you're gonna watch your, you're gonna watch Sunday afternoon football, which would you rather drink? Probably you're gonna to wanna to drink the, the you know, the booze that you bought at the at the um, at the store because there's better quality control. You know who knows what I'm putting in it, right? Who knows what the level of of alcohol is in it, and so forth, right? You might I might accidentally give you poison, <clears throat> so you prefer to buy the alcohol from the store. But if I suddenly make it, and so there's going to be a small market for my my booze, right? But if I can get the Baptists to pass the law that makes it illegal for, for, for people to legally sell booze on Sundays, I suddenly have a much better market for my, for my Bonica's backyard, you know, Bonica's backyard booze. Yeah, I like that, triple B, Bonica's backyard booze, right? So now you're gonna, you know, so I can, I stand to make a huge profit um, by getting the Baptist, by supporting the Baptist. So, so, um, so my, my economist friend uh, says, Whenever you see a policy like a policy being passed, think about the true believers, right? It's not so. So now let's set aside the Baptists, right? Let's say the true believers who really believe the policy is really going to do good, and then there's somebody else, most likely behind the scenes, who's thinking through, all right, what are the economic consequences of this policy? Let me see if I can get this policy tweaked a little bit so that it favors my business. So the ACA is a good example of this. The ACA, with all its expenses, uh, with, all, with the way that it made, um, one of the provisions was, if you're, a, if you're a insurance company, you have to pay out 80%. If you're a small insurance company, you have to pay out 80% of uh, the 
um, premiums that you collect in medical services, right? So if I collect $1,000 in medical, in, medical in, in premiums, I have to pay out $800 towards um, uh, actually paying for my uh, uh, subscribers' medical benefits. I can keep 200 of that, those dollars then to cover my administrative overhead and my profits, right? If I'm a large, um, if I'm a large uh, insurance company, I have to pay out 85%. So what that did was it made a lot of small insurance companies were operating at 70% medical loss ratio. So they were able to keep 30%, you know, and maybe higher. All those people couldn't stay in business because a lot of times their administrative costs were, would have killed their 20%, never mind profit. So all those people went out of business. So what we saw when the ACA was passed was basically a die off of many, many insurance companies. And you could say, well, good riddance to them. They were bad insurance companies anyway. Well, maybe. Um, but a lot of people were buying their services from them. So it was, you know, so we, what we saw, and, and at the end of the day, we saw a dramatic increase in insurance premiums for everyone. So one of the things that you can kind of take away from that is, yes, there were absolutely were Baptists in that scenario who supported the ACA. You know, I had, I had kind of an argument with one of my colleagues about it. Like, I don't know why we passed the ACA. Or so I made some kind of off the cuff comment like that. You know, because my thought was, well, you know, since most of the additional health coverage that we've gotten is the result of an increase in Medicaid, why don't we just increase Medicaid, make that more available, right? Instead of messing with the whole system. And my colleague said, you know, something like the reason we passed it was because um, we were tired of seeing people not get health care. And I was like, you're a Baptist. You, you really, really believe this. And I'm uh, much more of a, you know, I'm much more of a public choice guy. When I see that policy, I think, okay, yes, they're a Baptist, but there's a lot of people who are making a lot of money as a result of these policy changes. And so it's a useful lens. I'm spending a lot of time on this because it's a useful lens to think about policy. Um, whenever you hear somebody proposing a law, they're gonna tell you the Baptist story. They're gonna tell you the true believer story, but there's almost always a bootlegger component to that where somebody is making money somewhere or it wouldn't go through uh, because somebody's got to donate money to the politicians. And that's how the world goes round. So we just try to get the best possible outcome, um, but it's not going to be perfect. All right. All right. So I want to cover some, some, uh, so, all right. So that's kind of theoretical components there. I'd like you to remember the bootleggers and Baptists um, uh, idea um, uh, uh, as you go forward, both in this class and, and in life, right? To think about, it gives a neat little lens and, and the stories apply to, uh, uh, he, I've got a great podcast with this gentleman and he, he talks about, he was working as a, in a regulatory agency that oversaw lawnmowers. And it was a, it was a very funny thing. He happened to be renting a, his house from a guy who um, was a lawnmower manufacturer at the time, uh, who was like the president of a lawnmower manufacturer. And this lawnmowing company made a very high-end lawnmower, like a Toro kind of, well, you probably don't know. I don't know, some of you probably know, you know, mow lawns. Um, but you can get like a really nice lawnmower, you pay a few hundred dollars for it, you can get a junky lawnmower, right? Um, and, and so they passed this law back in whenever it was, the 70s or the 80s when he was writing it, um, talking about bootleggers and Baptists. And the regulation was going to require that you have things like a dead man clutch, right? Which is the thing where you, if you, you, you have this like little bar you have to squeeze, and then the lawnmower will chug along. And if you let go of the bar, it shuts the lawnmower off. And you guys, if you've mowed lawns in, in, you know, in your lifetime, I guarantee your lawnmower has this. So this was not a thing, you know, back in the seventies, you could buy lawnmowers without the dead man clutch. Um, and other thing, other safety equipment. So they were passing this law saying, all lawnmowers must now have all these things, say a dead man's clutch. Well, that adds cost to producing a lawnmower. <clears throat> And so he runs into this guy and he says at a party and he says, um, hey, I'm really sorry you know, about the, the regulations we're putting into place on lawnmowers. And the guy said, 
and the guy, the president of the lawnmower company, which was a high-end lawnmower company, right? Barely, this is an important part of the story, says, come over here, I need to tell you something. He says, okay, what is it? He said, this regulation is the best thing that's gonna happen to my company in a decade. And he's like, what? And he's like, yes, here's what's gonna happen. I already have all of that stuff on my lawnmowers, right? I already make lawnmowers that have a dead man's clutch and, you know, and, and, you know, special things to keep rocks from going flying and all that stuff. I already do that. I already pay for it. My competitors don't have that stuff. So now they're going to, in order to compete with me, they're going to have to start spending a whole lot more money making their lawnmowers. And so most of them can't afford to do that. Um, and they're going to go out of business. And so I'm going to have more of the market. I'm going to be able to sell more. Thanks to this regulation, I'm going to be able to sell more of my lawnmowers. I'm going to make a whole bunch of money. Right? So that's, you know, that's an, a, a, a true to life example. There's some other ones that you know, you, I, I can share the podcast if you're interested. Anyway, so let's talk about federal regulation of, uh, of both um, medical equipment and pharmaceuticals. It's gone from kind of the broad um, uh, the broad movement, right? The broad strokes movement of, re of regulation of, of um, medical technology has gone from kind of truth in advertising, right? just saying, being accurate about the products you're making and what they can actually do to then enforcing and regulating safety to make sure that if the thing is used the way you say that customers should use it or patients should use it, then it won't hurt them to, so, you, and this is kind of an inclusive process. So it starts with just telling the truth about what it is you're producing, which is, was a thing, right? Like we don't even think about that, but that was a problem um, to, okay, if people use it the way you tell them to use it, it won't hurt them to, if you tell people, if people use it the way you tell them to use it, not only will it not hurt them, but it will actually do what you claim it will do. Now these kind of are you're like, well, of course, but it's not, but it wasn't always so, right? So way back in, in the early 20th century, we had the Pure Food and Drugs Act, um, which the federal government is able to do because we have interstate commerce um, of food and drugs, right? And so, the, so we talked about this before. I, I told you the federal government, um, the structure of our government is such that the states have primary authority under the constitution to regulate economic activity. So this is why physicians are licensed at the state level, not at the federal level. Right. So nurses are licensed at the state level, not the federal level. That's an example of that. Electricians are licensed at the state level, not the federal level. So you can't get a federal electrician's license and travel from state to state doing electrical work. You have to, if you're going to do electrical work in Massachusetts, you have to have an, an electrician's license from Massachusetts. And you can't take that electrician's license from Massachusetts and do work up here in Durham unless you get a New Hampshire electrician's license. Same with healthcare, right? So the way, that, the way that the federal government gets around this is there is what's called an interstate commerce clause in the constitution, which says that the federal government has the authority to regulate commerce that happens between states. So if I'm moving something from New Hampshire to Massachusetts, that's interstate commerce. So then the federal government can get involved in um, regulating. So if I'm going to make a drug in, or, a, or a, a medical device, and we'll see a couple today, or if not today, Thursday, if I'm gonna make a medical device in Portsmouth at Medtronic, which they do, right? So they make insulin pumps, for example, I've got a picture of one. They make insulin pumps in, in, in Portsmouth, and I'm gonna ship it to California. I am now engaged in interstate commerce. And at that point, the federal government has the right to intervene and regulate what I'm doing. And this, and this is not just healthcare, it's everything, right? If I'm gonna make cereal in New Hampshire and sell it in Massachusetts, that's now interstate commerce. And so the federal government, fall, it falls under this Pure Food and Drugs Act, okay? So then if you're gonna sell, if you're gonna make something in one state, 
and sell it in another state, you are now subject to the federal government regulation. If you were going to make, if Medtronic was going to make insulin pumps in New Hampshire and only sell them in New Hampshire, they could do so and avoid federal oversight. But obviously Medtronic doesn't want to do that. Not only does Medtronic want to sell it, their, their products in every state, they want to sell them internationally too, right? So they're subject to a whole bunch of laws. So we have 1906 talking about, you know, Pure Food and Drugs Act. There's a bunch of whole, whole bunch of stories there. Um, there's a book called The Jungle. I mean, you read that in high school, right? It was talking about um, slaughterhouses in Chicago and how horrible they were. Um, the, this, is, this is part of what in, got this law passed back in 1906. Then 1930, we've got the, uh, the, the FDA is, is created or named, right? Um, in 38, we had um, uh, a problem, sul sulfanilamide, I can't say it, was an early, um, uh, was a sulfa drug. Um, it was one of the family of early um, uh, antibiotics. And so somebody got poisoned uh, as a result of, I want to say it was a result of an overdose, right? And so we have to now um, prove before you can sell something, you have to prove if I use it in the dose that you tell me to use in the way that you tell me to consume it, that I won't get hurt by it. Um, that doesn't mean that if, if you say take one pill once a day and I take 47 pills for breakfast, um, that that's not, you know, that's just dumb, right? Uh, at least for now, we still, we still, we're working on it, but we haven't outlawed dumb. Uh, and so, so, so that's what, you know, safety is, but then, but we don't, but I, uh, but I could be selling you sugar pills, right? I could be like, this is an antibiotic, you know, and it's actually a sugar pill, but as long as you only take three a day, you know, it won't poison you. And so it's safe. <clears throat> yeah, I mean, obviously, well, I mean, already we would have had to have branded and said, it's actually sugar pills. Like the co components would have to been sure, you know, I'm exaggerating a little bit. Um, I could have made something that, that looked like it would maybe sounds like it would actually cure you. Um, but as long as you took it in the dosages that I told you, it would pass the safety test. Then we had um, the thalidomide, uh, a thalidomide problem. So thalidomide uh, was being prescribed, uh, I believe it was for um, morning sickness for women who are pregnant. Obviously that's morning sickness, right? So when you're pregnant, uh, a lot of times you wake up and you'll, you know, you'll feel nauseous. And so thalidomide was prescribed in the uh, early 60s it was patented and, and then sold um, uh, for the purpose of, uh, uh, of, of helping with morning sickness. Does anybody know what happened to, women, to the children of women who uh, took thalidomide? That, yeah, right. So there, if, you, if you took it early in your, in your pregnancy, your child's arms and, and hands and feet, le legs and arms and legs would not properly form. And so the, the kids were, were with these, this um, condition were referred to as flipper babies because they looked like they had unformed um, arms and legs. So it was really tragic, uh, really tragic situation. And that generated uh, the Kef however Harris drug amendments, which basically said now the FDA had the authority now to do pre-market reviews, both of safety and efficacy. So not only did it have to be safe to take the drug, but it had to actually do what you said it was going to do. Now, thalidomide, that's a little more, still more on the safety side, obviously, right? But it's still, a lot of times what you'll see in policymaking is when something really tragic happens, politicians jump into gear to do something, right? That we ask them, do something, fix this. Um, Okay, so from there um, we had, uh, so that was for drugs. Now in 76, similar situation where we had um, uh, regulation of medical devices, um, including diagnostic processes. And this, they create a series of categories and kind of high level and low level risk um, categories and different 
amounts of you know caution that have to be taken, levels of proof that you have to engage in to show that this thing is both safe and efficacious. So when we think about drugs, we can it's pretty quick to think like, okay, I'm something I'm putting in my mouth and I don't want it to kill me, right? But when we talk about medical devices, we have things that are implantable medical devices, right? So we have pacemakers. I'll show you a picture of one, right? That actually gets put inside your chest and gets wired to your heart, right? That's a pretty dangerous thing. But there are other things that are regarded as uh, medical devices. Has anybody done 23andMe? The, the, the thing that tells you like how, where your ancestors are from and all that? No, yeah, okay. So this is a genetic test. And, in, and I think you can still, like the testing capability they have can tell you things, yes, it can tell you things like, you know, you're one, you know, you're, 10% Irish and 20% Italian and 47%, um, you know, Russian or whatever. Um, but it can also, and, uh, but it can also tell you, uh, you are at higher risk for um, breast cancer. You have a gene that, that indicates you have a high risk of breast cancer. You have a gene that makes you a high risk for um, prostate cancer, testicular cancer, ovarian cancer, right, and so on. Uh, you have a gene that means you'll likely get Parkinson's. Um, you know, all the, so they can tell that. You spit in the tube, and then they can send you back a report that tells you a whole lot of stuff about your medical, um, the likelihood of, uh, of genetic-based diseases. <clears throat> and so that initially came out. You know, I've got a slide about this later, so I'm getting a little ahead of my story. But that initially came out, and they just, you know, they just launched it, right? And then the government came back and said, whoa, whoa, slow down. Um, you are engaged in a, you have a diagnostic product here. That's not just a fun and games thing, right? Where you're telling people, you know, you're, you know, 4% Neanderthal, right? Apparently that's a thing you can, you can, um, you can be some percent Neanderthal somewhere back in your gene pool. Um, but you're telling people about medical stuff. Now you're, you've moved from, being an entertainment to being a diagnostic tool. And now we're gonna regulate you, right? Um, you could even, and, and so then the question moves on to, I'm, I'm not seeing anybody with an Apple watch, but you know, your Apple watch, people who have Apple watches, can, you know, it has all kinds of diagnostic capability in it. Uh, oh, maybe I see one over there, all right. Um, so is that a medical device or not, right? Uh, so we'll come back to that in a minute. So medical devices now being regulated, clearly the ones that are gonna be stuck inside your body, those should be regulated you know, without doubt some way. Um, but what about the things that never actually do any, you know, that are purely diagnostic in the sense that they never, they don't go inside you. They don't like maybe somebody put something on you, but it doesn't like electrocute you or anything like that. You know? So the answer to that is doesn't matter. If it's gonna be used for diagnosing medical um, disease, then it's gonna be covered now uh, uh, by the FDA. And the FDA has to, you have to prove to the FDA, not only is it safe, but that it actually does what you say it's gonna do. Uh, the Orphan Drug Act, this is an interesting issue. If you have a rare disease um, uh, and, and you know, a non-trivial number of people have rare diseases, it's often very hard to diagnose people with rare diseases often get um, misdiagnosed and then mistreated. Um, oftentimes they're, they're treated for psychiatric illness when, they're, when they really actually have a medical illness because people, you know, it's not falling into the normal diagnostic patterns that your physician sees. And so it gets missed. Um, a lot of these people with rare diseases need some sort of specialized medication. The problem is if you're Pfizer or you know, Moderna or um, GlaxoSmithKline or one of the big manufacturers of, of pharmaceuticals and there's 5,000 people in the world that need this drug, are you really gonna go through the process of investing what amounts to up to a billion dollars in developing the drug just so you can give it to 5,000, sell it to 5,000 people? And the answer is no, right? Because businessmen are greedy. 
they're not all greedy. They're not, they're, they're no more greedy than you or I, but businesses are run for a profit. And as bad as the CEO of Pfizer might feel about the fact that your Aunt Mary has a rare disease and needs a drug, and he could develop it um, if he had a spare billion dollars hanging around, um, he's just not going to do it. And it's not that he's a bad person. It's, this is an example of a market failure, right? There aren't, en there aren't enough people who are gonna buy the drug at the price that the drug, that, that the drug manufacturer would need to sell it at in order, to, in order to make the drug and make a reasonable profit. And so it doesn't happen. So this is an example of what we were talking about before about a market failure, right? Aunt Mary's not gonna get the drug that she needs and she might die as a result. And the people at Pfizer will feel very bad about it, but they're gonna say, look, that's, you know, we're not a charity, we're a business. And we'd love to do that uh, if you would pay us enough money. Well, uh, the Orphan Drug Act was written to help provide incentives for companies to do, orphan drugs are, are people with, are, are drugs where they would have low demand. So the Orphan Drug Act is an example of a government intervention that is meant to address a market failure, right? Um, uh, 92, we had the Prescription Drug User Fee Act, right? Um, uh, which allows uh, funds uh, for uh, the FDA to kind of speed up the review process because by the 80s, we were realizing, you know, as good an idea as it was to like actually make sure that the stuff that we said was in the drug was actually in the drug, that if you took the drug and the dosage that we, that uh, you, you're, you as a manufacturer suggesting people take it out, that it won't hurt you. And that, oh, by the way, if you take it for the symptom that the, the manufacturer says uh, it's meant to do, that it won't, it will actually help improve the symptom. All that stuff takes a, was taking a really long time for companies to prove to the FDA that all these things are the case. So Moderna, um, how long did it take Moderna? Have I already said this? How long did it take Moderna to develop the vaccine for, um, for COVID? Once they, got the, once they got the gene sequence, how long did it take Moderna to de develop the mRNA vaccine that many of us in this room have taken. Any guesses? Six months, okay. Other guesses? Three months, okay. Be brave, there's no harm. A week, too long. It was a weekend, they did it in a weekend. They got it on Friday, they had it on Monday. They had the drug ready to go. They had the, the drug designed, right? on Monday, got on Friday, on Monday, over a weekend. It then took a year while people were dying by the tens of thousands to get that, the approval to get it out to the market. It took a year, right, from then. Um, so, that's just an example of, you know, the F oh, and, and the FDA um, had all the materials over um, prior to Thanksgiving, and they were going to shut down for Thanksgiving and then resume administrative processing of the application after Thanksgiving. And the president had to basically say, no, no, you're not taking Thanksgiving off. You get to, you get to work through Thanksgiving this year, right? Um, that's the nature of, so that's the nature of, of you know, that's one of the natures of, of the federal government of, of government regulation is it is it is and I want you to think about this from the so first of all, it slows everything down, right? So there's there's lots of testing involved. The FDA is going to put its and so set aside the COVID one for now, because that's kind of a unique situation. We have this problem all the time with everything. Like you want to come out with a new, you know, a new um, uh, uh, a new variation on ibuprofen, right? Mo, you know, um, generic Motrin. It's got to go through this process, right? I'm going to put a I'm going to put a blue sugar coating on it and call it, um, you know, something new. 
um, really good ibuprofen or something. I want to brand it that. Um, the FDA has to review that. It has to make sure that what you're putting in it is what you're actually what you say you're putting in it is what you're actually putting in it. it. Has to make sure that it's going to be safe, and it's going to have to prove that it actually cures headaches and muscle soreness. Okay, that's going to take a long time. And so, the Prescription Drug User Fee Act basically said, "All right, we're going to we're going to allow um, the collection of some additional fees that will then uh, go to the FDA to fund additional people to review stuff." Right. Now, I want you to think for a second. I want you to think for a second, put yourself in the shoes of a regulator. So I'm painting those, these guys a, a little bit um, negatively, right? Uh, so I want you to put yourself now in the shoes of a regulator. You're the FDA. You work at the FDA. You work at the FDA because you actually do care about drug safety. It's the thing that you really believe is important. Um, and there are steps to be followed, right? Uh, which you know, if they're followed, they're more likely to result in an accurate result. Now, those steps are followed. Eventually, um, you will get the, the drug will eventually get to market. <clears throat> um, what if you rush it along because you think it's important and it goes to market and then some small child dies in Nebraska? because you didn't, you know, maybe you, you moved it along too fast or, you know, after the fact, they come back and say, the FDA didn't do a proper job of reviewing this, but you got that drug out and you got 10 other drugs out like it. And then the one went bad and some small child died in Nebraska. With the, um, with Tylenol? Oh, oh yeah, yeah. So, yeah, so. I mean, I think all the all these drugs got pushed along faster than 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 um, maybe were um, it's faster than would normally have been the case, right? Um, we had Operation Warp Speed that you know helped move them along. Um, I think Johnson and Johnson, you know, the example of Johnson and Johnson was um, it it made it through. Um, it was efficacious to a degree. It just isn't as good as the other ones are. Um, there was a there was somebody died from Johnson and Johnson, um, and I think what we kind of eventually realized was, look, none of these are going to be a hundred percent perfectly safe, and somebody with multiple comorbidities is going to be at risk from taking one of these drugs, right? But if you have multiple comorbidities, you could meaning you've got already got you know lots of illnesses running. I mean, you could just walk down the street and drop dead too. So it's not like. Um, the, I think the person, if I, if I remember correctly, the person who died or people who died after having taken Johnson and Johnson had pre-existing cardiac issues. So not to make light of it, but, uh, but I think at some point Johnson and Johnson, um, I, I, don't, I don't think, I don't, I'm not sure if that's even being marketed now or not. Uh, but, um, you know, it's just not as efficacious. It's not as effective as the, as the mRNA drugs. Um, but my, my example here, so make the, the point I want to make, let's see where we're at. The point I want to make <clears throat> is if you are a FDA regulator, you have no upside to making the thing go through faster. You don't get paid more. You actually get paid kind of shitty to begin with. You get paid poorly to begin with, right? Uh, as a government employee. And nobody pats you on the back for getting something through quickly. But if something goes wrong, you might lose your job. So it's all downside risk, no upside risk, right? So regulators tend to be overly cautious. They don't want to lose their jobs, you know, even though they're not making a ton of money, they don't want to lose their jobs. So they tend to be overly cautious. And so when you put a pro when you push something through a government regulation, government regulatory process. You have to do so with eyes open that the people who you are, the incentives that you are setting up for the review of these products, their incentives are all negative in the sense that they can only lose. And so they're going to do their best to prevent themselves from losing. So they're going to slow things down because they don't want to lose because there's no incentive for them to get it out faster because they don't get a bonus. They don't get paid more. They don't get promoted, right? It, 
they get fired if they make a mistake and they get their paycheck if they don't, right? So that's, you've got to bear that in mind when you, when you think about, I want the government to do something, is most government employees understand that they have no upside and all downside. All right, we'll stop there, pick up next time.